up, Doug. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> All right. Woo! All right, this is... All right, I'm Lily Fink Shapiro. I'm the manager for the Sustainable Food Systems Initiative here on campus. Welcome to our last Food Literacy for All class of the semester, and this is... Jerry Ann Hebron, Oakland Avenue Urban Farm. Peace, y'all. Jerry's been up since 1 a.m., everybody. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a little, I'm a little lonely. All right, so yeah. we're going to, this, this class, we're going to do a lightning fast recap of the whole semester, try to remember, um, just jog our brains of everyone we've heard from, and then we're going to introduce our speaker for tonight. So the class started off with Davida Davidson, who really introduced our theme of planting seeds of resistance and set up the framing for the whole semester. And then after Jerry, or sorry, after Jerry, after Davida, <laughs> We had Monica Ramirez who talked about the immigrant, immigrant farm workers and the uh, unjust conditions that they worked in. All right, and after Monica, then we had Chef Sean Sherman who's talking about revitalizing indigenous foodways. And he talked about how as, he, as soon as he started off as a chef, he realized that there was nothing representing the land or the history of the land that we were standing on. And he said he, what drove him is that he wanted to know what his ancestors were eating. Uh, before the European influence on the land. Then we had uh, Eric Campe, and uh, it was all about the seeds, and uh, how uh, seeds are a storage for information. And um, it's interesting because um, without the seed, we have no food. And so that seed needs to reproduce. All right, and then we invited Elizabeth Yump here, who was talking about climate justice and working on the front lines and what a leaderful community is. And that applies, obviously, there's inter intersections between food justice work and, and climate justice work. And she really drove that home for us. Ah, and then we had the food waste panel. Remember those crickets? <laughs> Jerry found some crickets in her pocket after class. Yeah. <laughs> Lily um, scammed me. All right, so we had the food waste panel, and then we had Anna LaPay here, who talked about a lot of things, including Hawaii and pesticide use and who is affected by the pesticide use. And she talked about the pesticide treadmill and how we're just using more and more and more of them. Christopher Gardner. And as the country gets richer and richer and richer, there's only so much meat you can eat unless you're in the USA. All right, so yeah, he really showed us the global trends. Um, then we had Ms. Shirley Sherrod here, and she talked so much about, that's when I was thinking that tonight is based on oceans and fish, um, but with Shirley Sherrod, we talked so much about land and land ownership and land cooperatives, and she talked about how equity is, is you have to deal with equity before you deal with anything else and talked about how um, you can't work on a little piece of land by yourself and you have to work with others. And she just is a beautiful model for cooperative and collaboration in the food system. And I actually learned something from her and it was about her uh, community land trust. I had no idea that that existed for 50 years. Uh, and then we had Samina Raja who uh, talked about um, Food literacy actually um, connects directly to policy uh, and how working in community we actually can affect the policy around food. All right, and this should be seeming more and more familiar because it's more and more recent. And then we just had Dara Cooper here who works for the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. And she, she pointed out how some of us, a lot of our speakers, a lot of us talk about the food system is broken. But she said, actually, the food system does exactly what it was designed to do, which is rooted in exploitation, and, and that it's performing beautifully in the way that it was designed to do. I missed this one, uh, the panel. Uh, our motto is grow a garden, grow a community. Through that, we are planting seeds of change on the east side of Detroit which uh, relates directly to the work that we do, which is cultivating food, community, and people. So um, I'm sorry I missed that panel. And 
I want to remind everybody that each, each class is filmed and available for free on the SFSI website. So if you missed any of these talks or if you want to share it with a friend or someone else, just Google. If you Google Food Literacy for All, you can find all the talks. I'd like to thank our partners, Anika Vanilla, Elise Gahan. Hey, raise your hand, Anika. Thank you. Wow, you've been awesome this semester. Detroit Food Policy Council, Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, Food Lab Detroit, Carol, Carl Cole and Michigan Media Team in the back, hey? David, um, oh, where's? Ours. I don't want to miss He's back his there. Name. He's back in the box. Hey, David. And hundreds of community attendees. And then also, can Elise, can you raise your hand too? Thank you, Elise. You've also been fantastic this semester. Thank you to our community for coming out uh, as well. We really appreciate you. All right. And as always, we want to thank our many sponsors because without them, we would not be here. So can we have a shout out for them? Thank you. All right, now Leslie's going to come up and share a little bit more. One thing, the reason we're doing all this is because normally we would have an entire class to have a wrap up to remind you what we just did all semester, to have some of you also come up and do little micro talks on things that really struck you or new topics that might have been missing in all the topics that we covered all semester. Um, so we just wanted to take a formal moment to thank all of you for being part of this course. For students in the room, thank you so much for being so fully and thoughtfully engaged all semester. Your discussion posts after each class were really wonderful to read. Um, your essays were incredibly thoughtful as well. So we hope that this class, at a minimum, gave you the food literacy enough to have a, that lens in whatever career you end up following. Um, and for those of you that are interested in trying to go even further down the food systems path, um, these are classes that we list on the Sustainable Food Systems Initiative, is that right? Sounds funny. SFSI, Sustainable Food Systems Initiative website. Um, and it lists courses that are available this fall for undergraduates, this coming fall, and also for graduates, and many more. Um, and then there'll be others in the winter as well. So that website is a great resource for you to just keep track of if you want to consider more courses in the future. Um, I think that's it for now. Oh, we want to remind you again to please take this quick survey, both students and community members. Students, we also have a formal university course evaluation that will be up until Monday. We also would like you to fill that out. That's our official course evaluation. But this one we designed, and we ask questions that are really particular to what we'd like to learn from you about how this course has impacted you uh, for both community members and for students. It's really critical for us to try to continue to raise money to keep this course going so that we can show funders, potential funders, um, how much this impacts everybody that's involved. And just again, go back also to the SFSI, Sustainable Food Systems Initiative website. That's where you're gonna find all these videos. If you missed any, if you wanna share any with anyone who wasn't able to come to some of these talks. The past year's talks are all up there too. And they're all also fantastic. And once again, for our final talk tonight, raise your hand if you're a community member, you don't have a, a clicker, if you'd like to participate in the clicker questions. Keep your hand up until you get one. All right, with that, we'd like to welcome Paul Greenberg after Lily introduces him. <laughs> we focused a lot this semester on land-based issues of our food system, and tonight we will turn our attention to the parts of our food system that take place in the ocean. It's an honor to introduce Paul Greenberg tonight who researches and writes about fish, aquaculture, and the future of the ocean. Since this is the final class, he's also our last Food Literacy for All speaker for the whole semester. Perhaps you've heard of Paul because he's a New York Times bestselling author of three books, Four Fish, American Catch, and The Omega Principle. Or maybe you know him because he's the winner of a James Beard Award for Writing and Literature. Or maybe you know him because you've heard him on NPR speaking with Carrie Gross of Fresh Air. Or maybe you're one of the millions of people who have watched his TED Talk. 
Or perhaps you've seen the 2017 PBS documentary he co-authored called The Fish on My Plate. To quote Sam Sifton, one of my favorite writers in the New York Times, he's the food editor of the New York Times, Four Fish is a necessary book for anyone truly interested in what we take from the sea to eat. Or perhaps you're not familiar with it, Paul, at all, but in any case, you're in for a treat this evening. Let's give a warm Michigan welcome to Paul Greenberg. Um, let me just make sure all the timing is right. So, um, you know, for a fish guy, coming to the Midwest is always, you know, an adjustment, but it's not necessarily a radical adjustment. It's just a shifting of perspective. But I do always like to get um, a sense of sort of how fishy the crowd is. Um, <laughs> Raise your hand if you eat fish like once a week. Pretty fishy. My, my standard just by the way is Seattle. <laughs> Seattle basically, you know, they, they come in like this. <laughs> um, but that's very good. Okay, raise your hand if you eat fish twice a week. It's very, I'm telling you, give Seattle a run for the money. Okay, raise your hand if you've ever gone for an entire year and eaten fish every single day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and a snack. <laughs> Okay, I did that once um, for a year. I, that was actually my frontline documentary. So it was sort of a dare, so it doesn't really count in the official survey. Don't worry, that's not one of the clicker questions. Um, all right, more importantly, because I know there's some marine ecologists in the room. Raise your hand if you've ever been fishing. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. All right, raise your hand if you're the kind of person who would cast a lure into a puddle because you thought you might have a one in 10,000 chance of catching something. <laughs> okay, it's always good to know where those are. Those are the best questions. We usually come from that part of the room. Okay, well, I am certainly that kind of person. That's me, age 10, um, with my 28-pound striped bass. Um, and, um, and I should say that, you know, here we are at U, Michigan. I was just at Notre Dame, and I know these are football schools. And rah, 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 rah. Um, I really don't care about football. Um, uh, sorry, it's sacrilege. Um, <laughs> You can haul me up. I'm a petard, whatever that is located. Um, I just was not into sports. So growing up, for me, like, this was my team. Like, I just loved the flow of fish into my local waters. It was like a symphony. Um, and whereas other, you know, people might have three seasons of sport, for me, the seasons, there were like 20 seasons. You know, March was when the flounder came in. April was when the tautog came in. And then we had the weak fish in May and the blue fish in June. It was just this incredibly beautiful, beautiful symphony of life that I just deeply, deeply participated in. So that kept going, and that was sort of my life growing up. And of course, you know, then I hit adolescence. And I have this sort of pet theory. I don't, we've never done the statistical analysis on this, but, but that basically the desire to catch fish is inversely proportional to the desire to pursue um, uh, people of the opposite gender of the same species. So, you know, so basically as my, you know, 15, 16, 17, the fishing jones went way, blah, 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 and the, and, uh, um, but then, you know, so, so, so I stopped fishing for a while, lived abroad for a while, you know, they started getting to middle age, and of course, you know, well, then, you know, that sort of starts to go down, and lo and behold, the fishing Jones kind of, kind of starts to build again. So I started fishing again in, in my late 30s, and um, when I went back to my local waters, I found that not, I didn't find this, I found this. I found that there had been this tremendous reduction in the numbers and the varieties of the different kind of fish in my local waters. And as I started to kind of think about this, I realized that, you know, that there was something there, there was something going on, um, not just in my local waters, but really pretty much everywhere. Because as I started to kind of look around, not just in Connecticut where I grew up, but in Florida or on the West Coast, I noticed there was this kind of weird repetition of a four fish again and again and again. So, you know, you'd always have a kind of pink steaky thing that you would throw on the grill or you would maybe like have it smoked and that would be your salmon. There'd be sort of a white flaky thing that would be uh, for your fish and chips and that would be your codfish. There'd be more of a kind of like solid white fish and that would be called bass and as we'll see that's a word that gets thrown a lot uh, completely indiscriminately. And then, and then suddenly there was sushi everywhere and that was your tuna. I, I was working in Moscow in the 90s and I remember seeing, walking down Tverskoy Boulevard and seeing five sushi restaurants in Moscow. And that's when I knew something weird was going on. When you have sushi in Moscow, that's really weird. Anyway, 
I suddenly was like, it was like, whoa, there's this weird thing going on where there's just these four kinds of fish again and again in all the markets. And I would tell people about it, you know, non-fishy people, not the kind of people who threw a you know, fishing lure into a puddle, but just regular people who didn't really follow the fish world. And when I told them that, they didn't really pick up on it. And I, then I realized that you really had to kind of show it in this format, because this is really the way <laughs> most people looked at fish on the plate. They, they just saw it as this, you know, this, this, these four kind of flesh archetypes again and again and again. So as this started kind of coming together, I realized that there might be sort of a, a theme going on here, that there might be, you know, something that was, in a way, very Michael Pollan-esque. Who here has read, read Michael Pollan before, right? So it's a very pollen -y kind of crowd. It's so funny. Sometimes I do lectures for, like, huge food conglomerates, and I say, you know, who here's heard of Michael Pollan? <coughs> chirp, chirp, chirp. Nobody's heard of him. So it's, no, but I know, now I know where I am. So, so, and I was thinking, like, you know, Michael Pollan, you know, he did Omnivore's Dilemma. He had his four meals. He did Botany of Desire and his four plants. And I was like, well, maybe there's something here. Or maybe I'm just plagiarizing. So I had to kind of decide, you know, it, you know, there's, there's a fine line between homage and outright theft. So I, I tried to figure out, well, was this, this, this thing really happening? Was it legitimate? Was it worthy of a whole book? And as I started kind of looking around, I started reading a book called A History of the Domestication of Mammals. And in that book, this Oxford professor points out that, you know, if you go back to the middens of Neolithic peoples 15,000 years ago, you'll find every kind of meat in their middens. You know, you'll find raccoon and goat and fox, and basically if we, could if we could catch it, we would eat it, and it was in those middens. But telescope to the age of animal husbandry in the uh, time of Christ, and you start to see these four mammals, right? Cows, goats, chicken, uh, cows, goats, pigs, um, and sheep. So hmm, I was like, oh, that, that actually does seem to make sense. And then uh, not long after that, um, I happened to be in the office of the author Mark Kurlansky. Anybody read Cod or Salt or the, um, the Big Oyster? Yeah, so he's a great writer, and it was exactly the kind of writer I wanted to be. He had all sorts of lithographs and boats and bottles and things like that. And um, at the time, he was working on his great book called The Big Oyster, which was all about oyster culture in New York City. And he had all these menus from 19th century New York. And he said, look at these menus. Look at all the birds on the menu, snipe, woodcock, grouse, 10 kinds of ducks, five kinds of geese, all these different kinds of wild birds. Because out here in the Midwest, there used to be professional shooters who would stand by the pothole legs and just go and blow away tons of birds that would end up in the New York markets. But again, telescope to the age of animal husbandry. And this is what you get, turkeys, ducks, chicken, and geese. So really a kind of leitmotif, a, a, a kind of repetition of these four things. By the way, so time for your clickers. Um, just a question. Americans eat around 200 pounds of terrestrial animal meat per year. How many pounds of seafood do they eat? So uh, w what's the procedure here? I wait for them to click. Yeah, you can read the answers if you want. Sorry. Pardon? You can read the answers, but you just wait. OK, when do the answers come up? Uh, you can read out the choices. Down in the corner. A, oh, down in the corner. Pounds. OK, what did you say? All right. No, oh, a couple of seconds. OK, sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, this is new to me. All right, well, do, 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 do. Anyway. Um, I'll move on and then, well, can I click back to it? No, no. Y'all gotta wait, here okay. Go, here we go. All right, here we go. <laughs> and the number one was C, 50 pounds, number two. All right, well, the correct answer is D, 15 pounds. Surprisingly little, it's like it's paltry, it's nothing. So it's really, really small. Which you can understand is a problem if you're the fish writer trying to get people interested in fish. I mean, I remember I actually had coffee with Michael Pollan one time just after um, food rules came out. And I was looking at Michael, he's, his clothes looked really good, and he looked really fit, like he had a trainer or something. And I was like, looked at my clothes, and I was like wearing stuff from The Gap, and I was like, I was like, 200 pounds of land food meat, 15 pounds of seafood. I bet, does this work out in terms of royalties and advances? Could be, who knows. Anyway, back to my fish, because it's my talk, not Michael's. Um, so here we had these four flesh archetypes. Here was this this real thing that was going on, and I realized that this could be really the spine of a book. This, this reduction of the, world down in, of the world of the ocean down into these four creatures. Um, how did this happen? What is, are the forces behind this? Well, one of the really big forces that we really don't really see in the terrestrial food system is the overhunting of the ocean, right? We're, we're, we already overhunted the land, right? We're done as far as the land being a place to get commercial, commercial food. But you can see in this graph, of fisheries over the last, since World War II, basically, a quadrupling 
of the amount of fish that we take from the ocean, 80 to 90 million metric tons of the fish, we, fish and shellfish that we take from the ocean every year. Now, I do like to point out at this point that you, know, you can go down a very depressing road with all this, right? You could say, oh my god, it's so depressing. They're taking 80 million metric tons of ocean life out of the sea every year. On the other hand, you could say, whoa, the ocean. 80 million metric tons of ocean, of, of, of sea life every year feeding us. I mean, the ocean, people assume the ocean is dead a lot of times, especially in these kind of forms, but it's not. It's still producing 80 to 90 million metric tons. And that, by the way, is equivalent of the human weight of China taken out of the ocean every single year. But there's another trend going on, which is develop, the development of aquaculture, the farming of marine life. And this is a huge, huge shift. 100 years ago, everything we took from the sea was wild, more or less. Now we're reaching the point where just about half of what we're taking from the sea is farmed. That's a huge, huge epical shift. That's a shift that we haven't seen since we came out of the caves 10,000 odd years ago. And if you combine the amount of wild fish we're taking from the sea and the amount of farmed fish that we're taking from the sea, it's equivalent to two Chinas, two human weights of China taken out of the sea every year. And by the way, it's no coincidence that I use China as the model here because China is now by far the largest catcher of fish and the larger, largest grower of fish in the entire world at this point. Um, the other trend that, and I'm a little bit making a mashup of uh, four fish in my next book, American Catch, which is that there's farmed and wild, but then there's a whole question of imported versus domestic. So, um, you know, this is a slide of my neighborhood in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan. When you think about it, America was founded as a fishing country. New York was founded as a fishing town, surrounded by giant sturgeon and huge runs of shad and oysters the sinus of dinner plates. It was really an amazing place. Um, and even so, um, it, it, even though things have diminished, it still had, this is my neighborhood, right near my neighborhood, this is um, the Fulton Fish Market, one of the largest fish markets in the world. When I moved into my neighborhood all the way downtown uh, in 2005, I was really thrilled that there was this huge fish market there. But then a few months after I moved in, um, I went to check in on the fish market and I found this, that the Fulton Fish Market had closed, that it had been moved all the way up to the Bronx where nobody interacted with it, nobody saw it at all. Um, and that brought up this interesting fact that um, the United States controls more ocean than any country on Earth, and yet 80% of our seafood comes to us from abroad. Really striking, right? I, I was, so I went up to the new Fulton Fish Market, all the way up in the Bronx, you know, just totally in the armpit of New York, way, way away from where everyone, where all the foot traffic is. And I remember I wa always wanted to meet this sort of famous, infamous fishmonger named Herb Slavin. I'd heard all these stories of him facing down people with Uzi machine guns and the mob moving, and all this crazy stuff. And I always wanted to meet Herb. So I went to Herb Slavin's uh, booth at the New Fulton Fish Market, and I said, is Herb around there? Yeah, sure. Herb comes out, I'm expecting some huge burly guy. It's a little Jewish guy about this big. He says, hello, I'm nice to meet you, I'm Herb Slavin. I was like, well, really? I go, Herb, you mind if I ask you a question? He goes, yeah, sure. I go, what do you think about the fact that 80% of our seafood in this country comes from abroad? And he goes, who's the broad? Like, with, <laughs> with like, not even missing a beat. He's like, I want to meet this lady, who is she? Um, but that was, the, that was the old fish market. Um, and it's a relevant question, you know, who is the broad? Where is the, all this, where is this seafood coming from? And it breaks down to a really, you know, very, very foreign picture from what we would expect seafood is coming to us. So all these things together, this, this wild farm, this foreign versus domestic, all of these things make really fertile territory for a fish writer aspiring, aspiring to have his clothes as nice as Michael Pollan to write something. So I went around the world and decided to look at my four fish, my four fish archetypes, um, and figure out what was going on and how we got to this place. So just as way of a general introduction, so um, there is only one species of salmon on the Atlantic side of uh, the United States. That's the Atlantic salmon, Salmo salar. And then we have five species of Pacific salmon. Actually, here in the Great Lakes, you might all know that once upon a time in Lake Ontario, you actually did have a native species of landlocked Atlantic salmon. That was extirpated around the early 20th century, late, 18, late 19th, early 20th century. You do have lake, uh, salmon in your lakes now, but they're from Washington State that they brought in after the extirpation of wild salmon. They brought them actually in part to control alewives that had invasively gotten into the lake. And so those are the salmon that you're seeing there. But in any case, so Atlantic salmon, Salmo salar, that's the fish that, uh, that most people see when they see farmed salmon um, on the plate. Um, 
And so as a salmon salar, that's the Latin name, the, the, the salmonid creature that jumps is literally how you translate it. But over the last few years, it's changed so much as a domesticated animal that some people call it Salmo domesticus, like that this fish that we've produced is a whole new variety of salmon. And here it is, your next question. So which of these is true? A, farm salmon today are nearly all genetically engineered through direct modification of their DNA. B, farm salmon contain higher levels of PCBs than they did 20 years ago. C, farm salmon often contain potentially dangerous levels of mercury. D, all of the above. E, none of the above, obviously excluding D, because, you know, that, it's a, a syntactical problem. All right, so yeah, so take a look at this, you know, question your, uh, yourselves thoroughly, see what you can come up with. Um, it, it is an interesting phenomenon of, I will say, I don't want to sway the, 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 um, the surveying, but I get all sorts of crazy thoughts around salmon when they come up and people always want to kind of pull me aside. So in a way, this is good for me because you're going to get this. And so the answer was D, all of the above, none of the above. <laughs> Striking, right? Farm salmon, there, there is only one genetically modified salmon. It only just passed the FDA. It's not on the market yet. Farm salmon contain higher levels of PCD than, no. We're feeding salmon less and less fish, so they contain, and the fish was actually com the, coming from wild fish that were contaminated by PCBs, so that's gone down. Uh, mercury is not usually an issue with farm salmon, so therefore none of the above. So take that with your biases and smoke <laughs> it. Um, anyway, how do we get to the point where we went from Salmo salar to Salmo domesticus? Well, really, you know, with most things that happen with fishing and overfishing, and collapse of fisheries, it's kind of a one-two punch. One punch is over-exploitation, overfishing, and the next punch is habitat destruction. So in the case of Atlantic salmon, there was a very clear signal for overfishing to occur. So this is a graph of bottom trawling uh, in the North Atlantic, um, and it shows you these big dips, right, during the First World War and the Second World War. I often say that if, um, if fish were to write the history of the world, they would call World War I and World War II, great reprieve number one and great reprieve number two, because nobody was fishing. And why weren't they fishing? Submarines, right? Nobody wants to fish while there are submarines trying to shoot you down. So huge uh, collapse in commercial fisheries and rise in abundance of wild fisheries. But after World War II, you know, scorched earth all over Europe, people needed food. And also people wanted to reassert their national sovereignty on the seas. And so a lot of countries set out fishing expeditions to find new stocks of fish all around the world, sometimes as a chance to get more fish, but sometimes as a chance to reestablish uh, marine uh, borders. So what happened with Atlantic salmon was exactly that kind of fishing expedition. So Atlantic salmon, um, they, you know, they are in rivers on either side of the Atlantic, but they all converge pretty much at two areas, one off of Greenland and one that you see off of the Faroe Islands. Before World War II, nobody really quite knew that that was happening. After World War II, when people set out on these fishing expeditions, they found the place where all the Atlantic salmon of the world gathered to feed. And they fished them, and they fished them really hard, like until, until the range of collapse. Like when I was a kid, I remember, did anyone remember as a kid Nova, Nova Scotia locks, like Nova locks? That was like a thing. Like, I mean, it's a little bit of a New York Jewish thing, but you had Nova locks on a bagel. That in the 70s was a wild fish. There is no more wild Nova Lox on the market. When you see Nova Lox, that is a memory name, not a real name. Um, the other thing, of course, that's gone on is destruction of habitat. So this is my home state of Connecticut. Um, every dot on this map is a dam. There are over 3,000 dams in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I often say this is why people in Connecticut are so uptight. Um, if, <laughs> If you, you know, Connecticut's chi is blocked. If you could just <laughs> unblock Connecticut's chi, imagine what a kind of open, friendly world we have. But I could equally show probably a very similar map of Michigan because there's tons and tons of, there's over a million dams, probably more like two million dams, blocking rivers, blocking the natural flow of salmon, alewives, sturgeon, shad, all these highly nutritious fish going up into these rivers um, that once produced really tremendous amounts of food for us most of it gone because of these influx of dams. And why were these dams built? A lot of times to grind corn, to make land food, right? To, to make this sort of, to, to remake America in Europe's image. And by doing so, we canceled that. It was a sort of delete and replace, delete seafood replaced with land food. 
So we start, so we, in the modern era, we've turned to the domestication of salmon. So why did we turn to the domestic, why did we turn to salmon first? Well, you know, you can see this, the four fish larval edition. Um, nobody's asked me to do a children's book of four fish yet. I don't know why, because <laughs> these are so cute, right? Um, anyway, you can see the salmon is at the top. And, and what do you notice about the salmon? Right, the, the big bulgy yolk sac. Salmon hatch out of these super nutrient rich eggs. We all know this, mmm, yum, ikura, sushi, mmm. Um, but that big, rich, nutrient rich egg allows a larval salmon to basically live off of itself for the first several weeks of its life. So once they've done that, they've transformed into a fish that then can be fed industrial feed. Other fish, as we'll see, don't have that luxury. Other fish actually need to eat live feed immediately, and that's a much harder thing to master. So because salmon had these super large eggs, they were able to be domesticated very, very quickly. And the domestication of these fish went berserko all over the world. This picture I took in Chile. This is in Puerto Montt. These are all Atlantic salmon fillets laid out. There are no salmonids native to the southern hemisphere. The equator acts as a thermal barrier so that no salmonids really ever crossed over into South America. Now, there are so many, there are probably more, some years there are more salmon produced in Chile than are produced in Norway. And they're using all of these fjords to grow all these salmon. Um, and, and it's really become a, a salmon powerhouse of sorts. Um, and now, of course, we're at the next phase. And this is where you know, everyone got crazy in their little clickers about the genetically modified fish. So, the salmon that we now grow as farm salmon are actually, they're not genetically engineered, but they are selected. They are artificially selected. Uh, when the Norwegian companies first started farming salmon, they chose 40 rivers throughout Norway. Long rivers, short rivers, fast rivers, slow rivers, and they had this wealth of genes to draw from. And so they were able to interbreed them. And of course, you know, breeding land animals is really slow, right? Because how many, ca how many you know, Young does a cow produce, one, maybe two in a year. Fish, you're talking about thousands and thousands. So you have this wealth of genetics to select from. So because of that, they were actually able to double the growth rate with half the feed of Atlantic salmon in about 20 years. But science being science and humans being greedy, that's not enough. So this latest incarnation is this company um, called Aqua Bounty has taken the already twice as fast growing Atlantic salmon. They've taken a growth gene from a Chinook salmon and then clipped onto it a regulator protein from this third fish, the ocean pout, which basically turns the growth gene on full, full time, full speed, um, to make a fish that grows even twice as fast as the already twice as fast growing uh, artificially selected salmon. Um, interestingly enough, the ocean pout turns out not to be a kosher fish. So I actually got into, you know, whatever. I get into these things with the rabbis sometimes. And, and I remember talking to the rabbis. I was like, Rabbi, if, if the fish, if, the, if, the, if, the, if this third fish is not kosher, is the fish kosher? Said, Relax. The genetically modified fish is kosher. It's got scales and fins. It's kosher. Don't worry. I mean, he didn't know what I was really worried about. But um, so suffice it to say, it will be kosher, but it will not be uh, a single fish contained within that genome. Um, Meanwhile, there are other problems that have arisen with the growth of the Atlantic salmon industry and the salmon industry in general. So in the early days of farming salmon, it could take as many as six pounds of wild fish to produce a single pound of farm salmon. We've improved that, right? And that's one of the reasons the PCB levels in farm salmon have gone down, because we've actually replaced a lot of the wild fish, which, as I said, was a vector for PCB contamination. We've replaced that with agricultural products like soy. So we've actually made below two pounds of wild fish to produce a pound of salmon. Problem is, aquaculture is growing at such a rate that we're actually uh, now topped out at the amount of little fish that we can catch to grow farmed fish. Actually, right now we're taking out of the sea somewhere between 20 and 25 million metric tons of little fish to be ground up and turned into fish feed. That's the equivalent of the human weight of the United States each and every year. There is one other thing to the salmon chapter, and I'm sorry to go on so long about salmon, but it is really vital to the understanding of this whole discussion, which is there's an issue going on right now, which is a, a whole new phase of this sort of delete and replace system, which is what's going on in Alaska. So this is Bristol Bay. It's the largest sockeye salmon fishery in the world. Um, it's so abundant, it's so full of salmon, that when you go fishing in Bristol Bay, you use this fly, it's called a flesh fly. 
It doesn't imitate a fly or a minnow. It imitates a piece of rotting salmon flesh that the rainbow trout like to eat. And I actually used a flesh fly to catch this uh, amazingly powerful rainbow trout in Bristol Bay, just surging with energy, surging against 10 knot currents, fought all the way. And when the guide went to hold it for a picture, um, it slipped out of his hands. Um, and it kept going. And it kept going. And it kept going. <laughs> That is not a Photoshop. That is actually the, the, the no animals were harmed in the production of this photo, uh, PowerPoint presentation. And we actually did catch the fish. And, it, and he put it down in the water, and the fish looked around and went zooming off against 10 knot current. That's the incredible energy and power that all that salmon coming in from the ocean, ocean, open ocean fuels. And it supports an incredibly diverse uh, commercial fishery, 12,000 jobs. And they're very handsome, and they fish under rainbows. Um, it's, <laughs> It's just amazing. It's a miracle. And it's not just uh, they that fish there. It's also people like these. This is Donald Trump Jr. and Donald Trump Jr. Jr. Uh, D2 and D3, as he identifies them on, on, on his Instagram feed. And he says, if you haven't read about the journey these amazing fish make and the transformations they make in their life, you should because it's unbelievable. Not my words, Donald Trump Jr.'s words. Well, meanwhile, his father has basically uh, put into motion the ruination of that same fishery because here is Bristol Bay the way it looks today, this amazing fishery with 60 million fish every single year. This is what's coming down the pike. Um, a series of mining claims topped off by Pebble Mine, the largest open pit copper and gold mine. We're now in a 90-day comment period where you can actually let your voice be known. I don't know if it's heard, but you can let it be known that you do not want to have what's potentially a toxic waste site atop the largest single species salmon fishery in the world. So what we have to do is we have to lock them up, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where this came from. I mean, who is this genius? I've been touring the country with this picture, and the genius who created this did not come forward. And I also, want, I also wonder, what's his political affiliation? Is this an homage? <laughs> or a decoupage. Like, what is, what's going on here? Does he love salmon and Trump so much that he wants to put them together and top them with whitefish? <laughs> also like how they've inversed the color, right? Shouldn't his face be whitefish and his hair be salmon? I don't know. Um, but in any case, I'd like to think that whoever created this has an open mind and he thinks that Trump could be locked up uh, and convinced that the value of, of this could be persuaded to him. So that's salmon. And if there's one message, to political message to take out of this talk, it's no pebble mine. And you have another month or so to let your um, voice be heard by the Army Corps of Engineers. If you Google Army Corps of Engineers and pebble mine, go for it. All right. So now we're on to our next fish. Um, I know, you know, whenever a teacher in a classroom says, well, today we're going to be talking about four things, you're like, oh my god, we only got through one. Um, but sorry, the other two go faster. So. The next fish on, on the plate is, is this kind of idea of the bass, the, the bass archetype. And this really is a story of kind of serial depletion of multiple species and multiple ecosystems all getting slotted under the same name. So like in my waters, the striped bass, the American striped bass went bust in the late 70s, early 80s. Actually, it was a full-scale moratorium in some of the eastern states. Um, similarly, what's happening in the southeast, you guys remember, um, Paul Prudhomme, the chef, he created a dish called blackened redfish. Anyone remember that dish? So this was a dish where you took, you know, kind of common fish caught by Cajuns, and you put some blackening powder on it, and it became a huge international sensation. And this fish went bust in, in, the, in the 80s. And then on the west coast, the California white sea bass, uh, another fish that's called, a, you know, so I should say the redfish is also called the red drum or the channel bass. So on the west coast, you had the California white sea bass, another <laughs> bass-like fish. And that went bust in the early 80s. Um, and then, you know, I had to include it here. Here's your friend, the walleye, um, a fish that, you know, you know and love. It's not technically a bass, but it fills that same sort of niche of that kind of substantial white fish that you'd like really to have at the center of the plate. The walleye, of course, and many Great Lakes fish under extreme duress in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with all these pollution and invasive species issues, to the point where we actually started having to bring in another bass from around, from the other side of the world, the Chilean sea bass. So the Chilean sea bass, you know, just appeared in the, probably in the mid 80s, and it stayed mostly on the west coast. Um, it made the jump to go national 
when, um, it, who of you have seen Jurassic Park? Raise your hand if you, oh, okay, good. Yeah, it's not an ignorant crowd by any means. So um, <laughs> you might recall there's a, one line in Jurassic Park where you know, Dr. Hammond, the, I don't know, if he, is he an evil scientist for reintroducing dinosaurs? I don't know, he's just, he's just clumsy. But um, after they've watched a velociraptor you know, in the lab vivisect uh, a live cow, he turns to his guests and says, oh, you all must be hungry. Alejandro, our chef, has prepared a delicious meal for us, a Chilean sea bass, I believe. That one line made the Chilean sea bass jump and become an, uh, a national, nationally desired fish leading to huge overfishing and piracy on the Southern Ocean, huge, huge kinds of things. Well, anyway, Chilean sea bass, American striped bass, channel bass, white sea bass, all these fish have this word bass in their name. But they have as much to do, echo, you know, sort of taxonomically as the ring king of lemur and my son, Luke Greenberg, right? So they, they vaguely look alike. They probably taste the same. Um, but they're, you know, I mean, I've observed my son under close circumstances. He behaves totally different from a ring-tailed lemur. Uh, although there are moments, you know, you never know. He has no tail. Um, so, so what it is is that we've created these culinary niches that rob specific ecologies of their specific fish because there's this overlap in flavor and taste. And then once we've gone through these cereal depletions, we move to, on to aquaculture. Right? Aquaculture is usually the thing that comes in at the tail end. It says, okay, we, you know, we messed up all the wild stuff, what can we grow? And that really came along with the European sea bass. Who's ever had a Branzino or a Lou de Mer, right? So it's not so much of a Midwest fish because you still have some white flesh fish here that you eat locally, but that was a fish that just like zoomed into the American market and all of a sudden there were Branzino everywhere. Um, why, did it, why was it able to kind of make its, its run? Well, one of it reasons was that they were able to figure out what to feed it. Now, sea monkeys. Whoever ordered sea monkeys from the back of a comic book? You know what's really um, heartening to see is that young people are still falling for this trick. Like in 1973, I bought my first sea monkeys, but it's nice to know that in 2019, people are still, how are they even knowing about sea monkeys? Are they reading comic books? Are they still, anyway, so I just love this ad. So easy, eager to please, they can even be trained. Well. Sea monkeys are actually very critical to the farming of marine species. So as I said earlier with the Atlantic salmon and with salmon in general, they have that big nutrient rich egg. But things like sea bass or the different kinds of basses, the persiforms if you want to use the taxonomic designation, they hatch out of these much smaller eggs and they need to transition, um, they need to move right onto live feed. So the first thing they figured out was that, that you could take um, a, a little tiny, very small organism called a rotifer, and you could enrich it with lipids, and it became this sort of like little vibrating ravioli that the very small little sea bass would hunt down. Then they need to transition onto bigger stuff, and that's when Artemia shrimp came along, these so-called sea monkeys. But interestingly enough, Artemia were branded as sea monkeys by a, neo, a Jewish neo-Nazi who also used to promote people diving off of diving boards into buckets. You remember that kind of thing that you would see in the Bugs Bunny cartoons? That was all him. He also invented those x-ray specs. Remember the x-ray specs you put on? You could see through people's clothes and so forth. I don't think that's really true. There was just red thread, but that's what he said. Anyway, these, um, this stuff, these sea monkeys, um, they might have this sort of silly use, but they have a very important use uh, in aquaculture because they're the next feed up. And interestingly, I was in Norway and I was writing a story about farmed codfish, and we were looking at some Artemia shrimp in, in the, on a microscope, and, and I said to the Norwegian scientist, where do these come from? He says, well, they come from the Great Salt Lake. I said, that's really interesting. I didn't know that Norway had a Great Salt Lake. He said, no, your Salt Lake, your Great Salt Lake. So it turns out the Great Salt Lake, which I'd always thought of as sort of a dead, place is an aquaculture engine for the world. And all these little salt, all these salt lakes around the world that you think of as these dead ecosystems are actually a huge, huge force in being able to propose and to propel aquaculture forward. So there's where we are with aquaculture right now. Because of this revolution of feed and because of this rising biotechnology, we now have the capacity to tame anything. We could tame anything, but should we? You know, is everything open for being tamed? That's a really big question going forward. And it leads us to our next fish. So this fish, you know, you know, I often introduce this as the codfish part, but I mean, here in the Midwest, right, there's a tradition of the, of the Friday fish fry, right? And that was your typical white-fleshed fish. 
Uh, up until the Great Lakes and freshwater water bodies, because I should say just in general, freshwater has been under much greater human assault than marine ecosystems. So up until you guys lost the commercial potential of Midwestern fish, you might have had those walleye and yellow perch and so forth as the standard fish fry thing. But as the seafood system became more internationalized, it was really these marine white-fleshed fish that started sort of filling your larders. And they, they also had a commercial representation as the, that great icon of American culinary <laughs> achievement, the filet of fish sandwich. So the filet of fish sandwich is actually an interesting story. So filet of fish sandwich was actually born in the Midwest. Um, it happened at the time, I think it was like 60s, and a franchise owner outside Cleveland noticed that nobody came into his McDonald's on Friday because they were Catholic and they didn't want, you know, they didn't eat beef on Friday. So he had this idea. He said, oh my God, I'll make a fish sandwich. Whoa, what an idea, breakthrough. And he went to Ray Kroc at McDonald's and he said, Ray, I have this brainstorm. I had this amazing idea for a sandwich. It's, it's gonna be a fish sandwich. Ray Kroc, unbeknownst to him, was working on his own sandwich. It was, remember the 60s, like madman time, it was really into Hawaii. So Ray Kroc had an idea for a sandwich called the hula burger. It was gonna be a slice of pineapple on a bun. <laughs> so Ray Kroc, Ray's like, nah, I don't want your filet fish. I already got it, I got a hula burger. And the franchise owner said, Ray, what do you say? Your, my filet of fish versus your hula burger. We'll see who wins. Well, we all know who won, right? And um, the first filet of fish sandwich was made from halibut. And when the franchise owner brought it in to uh, Ray Kroc, he, Ray said, well, how much you want for that sandwich? He said, I don't know, 65 cents, price says 65 cents. Ray Kroc said, no way, we cannot do a fish sandwich for 65 cents. I need it at 25 cents. So what did he choose? Atlantic cod. And so those of you who've read Mark Kurlansky's cod or have looked into fisheries issues know very well that these Atlantic uh, marine fish, uh, ground fish, cod haddock, Massive collapse uh, in the um, late 80s, early 90s, the closure of the Grand Banks, the closure of large sections of the Georges Bank, so that now the filet of fish sandwich is actually made from pollock, fish that probably most of you haven't heard of, but it's actually the largest food fish fishery in the United States, two to three billion pounds caught every single year. It's actually the fish um, in uh, a California roll. Um, those of you who like the, the show uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, you might remember that Larry David and his wife end up breaking up because during sex, Larry can't stop talking about the difference between fake crab and real crab. Um, <laughs> so the fake crab is actually Alaskan Pollock. And um, so that's yeah, two to three billion pounds every single year taken out of the ocean, mostly to make things like fish sandwiches. And most recently, of course, is the appearance of tilapia. Uh, I'm, one aquaculture scientist I know said to me um, that he, um, First time he heard the word tilapia, he thought it was a stomach disease. Um, but um, it's not a stomach disease. It's actually, you know, again, in the big ecological picture, not such a bad choice. It goes from an egg to an adult in about nine months. Just by comparison, a salmon is a couple of years. So it grows really, really quickly. Um, and it has really become the sort of off-brand. I mean, McDonald's is not making tilapia filet of fish. But, you know, you know, when you're driving on a long road trip, it's like, isn't there McDonald's around here? But there's like McHenry's and it's like some weird off-brand chain and they have a fish sandwich, chances are it's tilapia. Um, and then the other fish, um, well, no, sorry, I'll complete my tilapia thought. So this to me is like the apotheosis of everything I think that's gone on. Here you have the Gorton's fisherman, right? The Gorton's this icon of the Gloucester, you know, Boston ground fish fisherman, and he's going out to sea, and he's gonna go out to George's bank, and he's gonna bring you back some tilapia. Well, I mean, it's ridiculous, tilapia are farmed fish, they actually die if the water goes below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's impossible. But yet for the American consumer, somehow this weird mashup sort of works for them. And beyond that, beyond the off-brand, beyond like the super off-brand, there's even more sort of low-grade white fish that have entered the market, um, which is this fellow. So this is the Pangasius catfish, uh, mostly from Vietnam. It's the sixth most consumed seafood in America at this point. This is the fish that like you go into the hospital for a procedure. And the next day, the orderly says, what would you like for lunch today, chicken or fish? And you're like, I don't know, what's the fish? I don't know, mister, it's just fish. And well, chances are it's this bad boy, um, the Pangasius catfish. Ladies and gentlemen, the sixth most consumed seafood in America. So we, we've, we've entered this range of where we're so dissociated from what 
is the actual ecology that brings fish to our plates, that we're willing to accept this as kind of a stand-in for what have, would have been a fish that was intimately known like a yellow perch in the Midwest. So the fourth fish is, is the tuna, right? So this is the fish that I think has, is really the, the superstar of the, la the last and final phase of the exploitation of the ocean. Um, there are 23 different species of fish roughly called tuna. Um, the most commonly canned tuna are things like skipjack and albacore. The more sort of weighty, uh, meaty, sushi-like tuna are the yellowfin, the bluefin, and the big eye. Um, and these fish are really global fish, right? They, they're highly, highly migratory. And they're managed, I mean, it's just so crazy to me that this map exists. So these are the management areas of these highly migratory fish. They're, they're, these, they're these organizations called Regional Fisheries Management Organizations. And they manage these fish that swim from one part of the ocean to the other. Um, our particular on the Atlantic coast, uh, Regional Fisheries Management Organization is called ICAT, the Inter International Committee for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. Uh, my friend, the great conservationist Carl Safina, calls it the international conspiracy to catch all the tuna. Um, <laughs> and it's really the, the, the workings, the inner workings of these of these RFMOs are really crazy. Like they'll have a scientific community committee, and they'll look at the spawning stock, and they'll look at the product, you know reproductive success. Blah, blah, blah. The, uh, you can catch you know 10 million metric tons of albacore. And they present that to the political committee. And the political committee is like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Japan kind of wants a little more, and so does Nigeria. Let's make it 12 million. So like this scientific recommendation gets completely thrown out the window, which is why these are some of the most vulnerable fish out there. And people are actually starting to try and figure out if you could aquaculture them, if you could farm them. But it's a tremendously poor choice for aquaculture. So remember I was saying how salmon, in the early days of salmon, six pounds of wild fish to grow a single pound of, uh, of, of salmon. With tuna, 20 pounds of wild fish to grow a single pound of tuna. Why? Well, tuna are actually warm-blooded. Some of the, the larger tuna actually heat their bodies 20 degrees centigrade above uh, ambient temperature. Um, they also swim at like 40, they can swim at 40 miles an hour. So is that the kind of fish you want to put in a tank and feed pellets? No. So it's really, really not a very good choice. So you know, not to leave you completely befuddled, I think it's important to ask this question, well, what should we eat? Should, you know, plus I also like to use this shrimp as a question mark. I kind of, you know, it took me hours to do this. Like, you can't believe the amount of procrastination, the, the amount of writing time that was absorbed trying to get that cocktail sauce per perfectly circular. The remove background function, it kept, and I, and I enlarged it and I clicked and, oh, it was, uh, anyway. So, this really makes me satisfied. So, so what should we eat? Well, one thing to think about is we could think about eating some of these little fish that are ground up by the millions of tons every single year to make fish feed. Fish like anchovies, fish like ancho uh, um, herring, fish like uh, alewives, all these little fish that are actually quite high in omega-3s and very low in the amount of uh, fuel that they need to bring to market. So we could be doing that. Another option would be to start looking at filtering, filter feeding organisms, like things like oysters, things like seaweed. Um, these are organisms that actually remove nitrates from the marine environment. And as you guys probably know here in the Midwest, the problem of excess nitrates and excess, ex excess phosphates in the water system is a huge problem. And what is it being caused by? It's actually being caused by um, the omega-3s, blah, 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 uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's being caused by fertilizer, right? You know, here in the, here in the Midwest, where, you know, this, this is a picture that I um, took at a fertilizer depot in Minnesota. And just tons and tons of fertilizer piled up that's washing into our waterways, causing the blooming of algae, which causes dead zones. By the way, you know where I took this photo? Walnut Grove, Minnesota, right? Little house on the prairie. What would Pa say if he said to him <laughs> that in order to grow this stuff, you would have to dump this huge, giant fertilizer dump? And you know, these are, all these phosphates and all these nitrates are washing into the, uh, the watersheds of this nation at tremendous rates the point where we now have a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, oftentimes the size of the state of New Jersey. And here, more familiar picture, um, here in Lake Ontario, just next door, you see these massive algal, algal blooms. Some of it caused by urban, urban runoff, but a large, of it, large part of it caused by these industrial crops that are um, really, really, I think, deeply hurting our country. And of course, they're also hurting our world. Um, land food production is extremely costly from a carbon perspective. Um, 
probably after energy production, land food production is probably the greatest source of um, greenhouse gases. Fish, surprisingly, fish and shellfish, generally speaking, are actually lower in carbon emissions. Why? Fish float, right? So all the an energy that an animal has to put into standing, a fish can use to putting on more meat. Fish are cold-blooded. So all the energy an animal, a land animal has to use to heat its body, a fish potentially can put into making more meat. So the last question then is, you know, going forward, what should we do? Should we, should we, should we grow fish? What, what, what should be the solution? And that brings us to the final question. Which of these statements do you st most strongly agree with? A, the U.S. should ban aquaculture and support wild fisheries. B, the U.S. should limit aquaculture to only filter feeding shellfish and seaweed. C, the U.S. should stop catching wild fish and focus exclusively on aquaculture. D, the U.S. should encourage a balance of wild fish catching and aquaculture. So there's no right answer to this one. This is really just trying to gauge what your opinion is. I'll be very curious to see what you say because, you know, it really spans the, um, the range of different opinions. There's, you know, there's certainly people out there who've taken a position that they will never eat a farmed fish. Uh, there's some people who choose to, like, be completely oblivious and just eat whatever lands on their plate. So let's see what... Uh, what Ann Arbor has to say about this burning question. And I should say, it's, it's definitely a question that's been hotly debated in the White House right now. You know, after oil, seafood is the largest single deficit item in the American tr uh, uh, portfolio. And here we go. Yeah, so U.S. should encourage amounts. Yeah, that was kind of a loaded. I mean, I sort of directed the question, the answer. <laughs> you should do this stupid thing, you should do that stupid thing, and this other stupid thing. And, oh, okay, here's the perfect thing, right? So this is how, it shows you. My partner is actually a statistician, so she's taught me how to design surveys to get the results that I want. Um, <laughs> so yeah, scientifically approved by Columbia University. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so yeah, so I actually do, I agree also with Dee that we should try to get an aquaculture program in this country going. And there are ways to grow fish in a way that is not so compromising to the environment. I think very interestingly is now we can actually produce omega-3 fatty acids. And I'm not going to go into the whole omega-3 thing. If you want, you can read my book, The Omega Principle. But basically, it is now possible to synthesize omega-3s from algae through photosynthesis that we can then provide as both supplements and as aqua feed for marine fish. We can also actually, I saw there was a bit about uh, food waste and crickets. There was some laughter about that. So totally into the bugs and the food waste. Um, the black soldier fly larvae, I don't know if you discussed that, but that's really the, the great grubby hope of the aquaculture world because it can be set upon food waste and to transform that food waste into really um, a, a fish feed that's 98% as nutritious um, as, as, as wild fish. So I think those ways you could kind of get there. And I think it's also important not to forget the possibilities of your local fisheries, both wild fisheries and aquaculture. I just grabbed these quickly off the web, um, but just, you know, there are commercial fisheries here in the Great Lakes. It is worth supporting them. And there are places like uh, in Michigan, throughout the Midwest, there are a number of these containment shrimp farms starting to appear. I had a graduate student come to me with a thesis that suggested that the rust belt could become the indoor aquaculture belt, that there's all this empty factory space that potentially could house a whole aquaculture revolution. I think that's, I'd really much rather see fish being produced in those than you know, more coal being burned. I mean, let's try and think constructively about how we can have a sustainable food system. So I'll just leave you with a short passage, actually not from Four Fish, but from um, the next book that I wrote after it called American Catch, which is just sort of a, you know, a little bit of an ode to the idea of you know, what this country could be as, as a fishier place. Um, I took this picture, this is in Bristol Bay, and um, it's my most Renaissance-like photograph ever taken. You know, <laughs> I'm tempted to send it into Apple. This shot with the iPhone and lots of em emotion. Um, <laughs> but I took this on July 4th, um, which is actually my birthday, and it's actually the, the peak of the sockeye salmon run in Alaska. Um, so I took this picture, and, and I'll just read this little passage. Um, Passing up to a bluff, I look down on the isolated little settlement washed by the foam of the Bering Sea and thought that once upon a time, a little 17th century fishing village called New Amsterdam must have looked quite a bit like this. Up top is New Amsterdam, below it is Bristol Bay in Alaska. A modest place with its face turned toward the sea, where the fishermen and the fishmonger were an integral part of daily life and where seafood held its own with land food in nearly every regard. What kind of alternative future might America have had if the descendants of New Amsterdam had decided that seafood 
not land food, would be to the new country's bread and butter. Not a Jeffersonian society that relied upon the harvests of agriculture, nor a Hamiltonian one that captained banking and industry, but rather a Neptunian democracy that lived off the sea. A place where estuaries were recognized as the heart of the food system, where rivers were rarely fettered for fear of impending the miraculous runs of salmon, sturgeon, shad, and herring, where human development moved in parallel with the protection of the near shore. What kind of society might we have formed had we not, as Melville wrote in Moby Dick, become landsmen, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks? What if instead we had become what Melville called a society fixed in ocean reveries. Thank you. So yeah, so I guess I'm happy to take questions. Um, I've done enough of these that I can actually ask myself questions uh, if you don't have questions. But that's a very sad scenario. So even if you just want to ask about like my aunt, she's doing well, thank you, she's out of the hospital. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm, no, seriously, anything you, any fish you wish, believe me, I'll, I'll, any fish you wish. And, and I welcome any points about Great Lakes fisheries because I'm, you know, I know roughly the history, but I'm always ready to be enlightened. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm a graduate student at the School for Environment and Sustainability. Great. And I recently heard about how about a third of the fish that's caught actually goes to waste, either from not being purchased or problems with refrigeration. Mm -hmm. Do you have any solutions or ideas about how we can reduce that number? That's an excellent point. Um, yeah, about a third of the fish going to waste. It might even be higher than that. I mean, let's face it, we have a food waste problem in general in this country. I mean, I think it's like 40, 45% of all food. Um, one, a couple things. First of all, there's a lot we could be doing with fish waste that we're not doing fish waste that we, the consumer, don't even ever see. So when I was working on my Omega-3 book, uh, there was a guy named Sandro Lane who produced um, the first sort of lox grade smoked salmon coming from Alaska. And a few years back, um, uh, Martha Stewart came and visited him, um, went, came up to his fish factory, uh, where his processing factory. And um, she, he led her through the, the sort of guts and gurry room and she looked around, and very un-Martha Stewart-like, she said, can't you do anything with all this? And, um, and Sandra thought about it. He's like, maybe we could. And actually, he realized that he could take all of those guts and press them and get fish oil for supplements out of those guts. So that was one thing they could do. But he also realized that all those guts and so forth um, could actually be used to produce aquaculture feed in the first place. So we could close that waste system right then and there. Um, I think another way, uh, um, you know, just you as the consumer could probably handle this in a better way, is to not be so afraid of frozen fish. Because keep in mind that when you're buying fresh fish, and it's not often that you're buying fresh fish, by the way. A lot of times you think you're getting fresh fish, but oftentimes it's just been defrosted and put there on the ice counter. But when you're buying truly fresh fish, that is a much more carbon intensive product than a, a, a frozen out of the water fish. When you go to these Alaska processing plants, the ones that are producing these like portion fillets, they come right out of the water, they're blast frozen below 40 degrees, uh, minus 40, um, which causes them to freeze so quickly that ice crystals don't form so you don't get that sort of mushy rubbery quality that fish back in the, frozen fish back in the 70s used to have. Once you've got them frozen, you can put them into the hold of a boat, sail them anywhere you want in the world, and you have much lower carbon fish footprint because once you've brought stuff down to temperature, it's much cheaper from a carbon perspective to keep them frozen than it is to keep them what's called the cool chain. So I think you know, there's a lot of waste that can be eliminated at the factory, but I also think that this whole desire for like fresh product all the time, I think leads to waste because fish is a perish perishable product. If you can get fish into its frozen state as quickly as possible, you're gonna get less waste. Next question. Hello, Hi. my name is Leah. I'm an undergraduate public policy student. Yeah. And I'm a pescatarian. And Congratulations. I would thank you. I was wondering I was wondering if you could talk about um, what you think about the the sustainability differences between having a vegan, vegetarian, or pescatarian lifestyle. And I'm hoping you're going to tell me that I'm doing the best <laughs> thing because I love fish. Um, it's that's a very good question and it's also very relevant to sort of where I'm at in my own personal journey. So as I mentioned at the head of the talk, 
I did go for a year where I ate fish for every single meal. Um, I ended up with super high mercury levels, so that was a concern. Uh, basically, uh, I remember I had my mercury, my mercury results came in when I was doing some, a story in Alaska, and I happened to be at the P Department of Public Health, and they, I said, what would you do if one of your people in Alaska came in with numbers like this? What would happen? He said, well, we'd send somebody out to your village and tell you to stop eating so much whale blubber. Um, <laughs> that, that's how I, my mercury level. So, um, but not to joke, um, I think, really, that there are many things to recommend fish from a sustainability point of view. Um, but it needs to be thought of in the context of a larger shift towards plant-based nutrition. So I, the, the diet that I sort of invented in the course of writing the Omega Principle book was what I call a pescatarian diet. So what is the Mediterranean diet? So the Mediterranean diet, right, they figured out in the 1940s, right, very famous study where this guy named Leland Albaugh went on the invitation of the Greek government to Crete because they wanted these, the Americans to improve the diet of Crete. Right? He got there. He found that the Cre Cretans were living four years longer than the Americans. They had no cardiovascular disease and no cancer. And what was the major difference? Very little meat. Not no meat and not no fish, but something on the order of one to two times per week. So I'm sort of trending in the direction of this pescatarian diet, that is, a diet that's largely plant-based, but when you do have animal-based products, trend towards um, sustainably grown shellfish, uh, sustainably grown fish, and wild fish that are well managed. So a couple of portions of that per week and a lot of vegetables. That to me, I think, is probably the best we're going to do as far as our health is concerned and as far as the environment is concerned. Is there a question here? Hi, my name is Joel. I wondered what you know about the Asian carp and um, whether or not anyone is trying to commercialize that fish to solve that problem. Excellent question. Um, has anybody ever seen the video on YouTube called The Carp Hunters? I say strong, I'm just gonna make a huge boost in that guy's YouTube page. But um, it's this crazy scene where this guy is like sort of in this weird kind of Roman regalia and he's water skiing and he's got a sword. And, he's, and he, I think he's on the Illinois River and the carp are just jumping out of the water and he's like swatting them with the sword. And, the, and the, the triumphal scene, he grabs a fish and puts it on the spikes of his helmet. So it's, it's really awesome. So, but <laughs> more seriously, so I've eaten Asian carp and they're quite tasty actually. Um, I think that they're one of the best tasting freshwater fish I've ever tried and I've eaten a lot of fish. Um, the problem is the bones. And the problem is that the bone structure, like all the cyprinids, are kind of like this. You know, you know, you take a salmon, you fillet it, and there's just some pin bones to take out of the middle. Or other fish, you know, if you fillet them correctly, there's no bones at all. So you have to deal with the bones in some kind of way. There, are, um, there was a guy in Chicago who was trying to do an Asian carp burger, um, I remember, because you're going to need some sort of extruding process where you can get past the bones. Uh, there was a great chef in New York named Peter Hoffman, had a very famous restaurant called Savoy, and he pioneered this really delicious version of Asian carp, which was a spare rib, an Asian carp spare rib. He found that if you made horizontal cuts in the filet, you could end up with a single bone in, in, your, in your meat. I think Americans, that's about as much bone as Americans can deal with one bone, right? Like, one bone I can handle. This is too complicated. I can't get it. Um, but it was delicious, and he sort of marinated in barbecue sauce. It was really, really good. Um, the other issue with the Asian carp is how do you harvest it without completely devastating the water body, you know, with, with destroying with bycatch. So an interesting thing about Asian carp is, you know, they, they tend to jump, as you've seen from the videos. Um, I did meet this crazy net designer in Louisiana who would design nets. He had visions in the night, like, 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 like celestial visions. And he would wake up, say, honey, I figured out the net. Um, and, <laughs> He actually dreamed up a net for Asian carp, and he actually brought it to Sea Grant. It was a net that skimmed along the surface of the river and shot out an electromagnetic pulse ahead of it. And it caused the carp to jump up in the air and then land in the back of the net without any bycatch. Um, there's some other physics problems with that, I'm sure, as the net gets heavier. What do you do? I don't know. So all that being said, I think it's possible. I think we have to figure it out. There's another possibility. Potentially, we could grind it up and make it into supplements and make it into an animal feed. That's possible. But you know, you need to have 
you need to have a commercial entity that's prepared not just to dabble in it, right? Like you need five, 10 years of commitment to make an industry. Um, I'd love to see it happen. I think it would be a great thing. Um, and I think, you know, might be the only way that we're ever gonna get out of this Asian crop problem in the first place. Uh, nice, nice talk. My Thank name you. Is Jake. Um, so just for sort of clarity or discussion's sake, uh, it sort of sounds like you're saying that that um, aquaculture is a sustainable solution. And I would argue against that. And I would also argue that the wild caught industry is, has, is sort of underappreciated for its potential. And I guess, could you just speak to that? Yeah. Because well, I you wanna know, just, cause I wanna make sure there's a lot of students in the audience and make sure that they have a full representation of particularly the aquaculture industry. Totally. Well, so, you know, it's funny because you exactly enunciated the internal argument I have with myself. So when I wrote For Fish, it was really largely arguing for sustainable aquaculture. When I wrote American Catch, you know, this is all about American wild fisheries and how they've been ignored and how they've been trodden over. Um, I guess the only compromise solution that I can come to, certainly there are problems with aquaculture. I think when we speak of aquaculture, we're actually speaking about many different kinds of systems. You know, there's the farming of mussels, there's the farming of oysters that don't require the feed, you know, them to be fed. There's the farming of seaweed, which removes nitrates from the water column. Beneficial in my mind. Um, I've come to the sort of feeling that the enemy isn't wild or, farm shouldn't be the enemy of wild and wild shouldn't be the enemy of farmed. What, what, the real dichotomy in my mind is land, for, land food versus seafood. Um, to me, what the real problem is, the corn, soy, pork, chicken, beef monopoly on so much of our agricultural production. And that if we could kind of strike a compromise between wild fish and farmed fish, and to grow both sectors in a sustainable way, that that would be a better alternative to the land food oligopoly that we have on our hands right now. You know, it's an evolving thing, you know, and as I say, I argue with myself all the time. Um, I do really love fishing communities. I really do respect what they do. You know, there was a guy, uh, I remember in interviewing in, in Gloucester who said to me, you know, you hear about fish processing houses becoming hotels on the waterfront all the time, but you never hear about a hotel becoming a fish house. Once we lose the seafood infrastructure of our coasts, you never get it back. And we've lost so much of that. You know, if you go to, especially in the southeast, that's the most recently dec decimated area. You're just seeing like the gentrification of these waterfronts. And actually right here, you know, it's, we were just chatting, Lily and I were chatting before the talk, that the Great Lakes is one of the worst examples of this in the sense that before all the lamprey and you know, all the habitat destruction that went on in the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes was a huge commercial fishery. And over the course, once the invasive species came in and all the Pacific salmon went in, the Great Lakes has essentially become a, a recreational fishery. And once you have recreational people kind of putting down their thumb and saying, oh, we don't want any more commercial going on, you've socioeconomically shifted the whole nature of the watershed which is not a shift, you know, it's funny because I came to this argument originally as a sport fisherman, and if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I would have said, you know, oh no, the sport fishermen, they don't do that much harm, we should really be the protectors of the watershed. But I actually think if we can engineer it correctly, I mean, there's an old Yiddish proverb, don't shit where you eat. And in a sense, that's what we're doing throughout of our watersheds because we've abandoned them as, as food systems. So anything that makes these food systems food systems again, whether it's aquaculture or wild fisheries, if we can find a compromise between those two, I think is a good idea. So, thank you though, good question. Hi, I'm Nana Brichum, I'm a grad student. I have a quick question on, um, what do you think of catch shares that were implemented in New England? I know it's like cap and trade for fish, but like, can you talk a little bit about the sure. positives and negatives? Yeah, excellent question. So catch shares, um, just a quick tutorial on those of you who've not had your noses in those particular waters. So, you know, it used to be in uh, wild fisheries were sort of characterized by what was called a, as a race for fish, that there were pretty much open access to fisheries and season limits and maybe some size limits. 
but anyone who wanted to fish could fish, and that, of course, led to the kind of classic tragedy of the common situation. In the last 30, 40 years, we've been transitioning to quota systems, and one incarnation of that is cat shares, where by you look at the historical nature of the fishery, and you kind of pre-sell the fish while they're still in the water. So you say, you know, Captain O'Leary gets, you know, 40 tons of haddock. Um, Captain O'Shaughnessy, you know, you can say I'm talking about Boston area, but um, he gets whatever 30 tons of haddock. And you, and you apportion it out, you know, in such a way so that once you've caught your quota, you're done. So that way, you never overfish in an ideal world because you're just always just staying within what the, the scientists have set an overall amount of fish that can be taken and they've divided it up in, in, in advance so that everyone should get their share and we won't overfish. That is a, theoretically, it's a good model and it's actually worked pretty well on the West Coast. In New England, you've probably read the story of the Codfather, um, worth reading a, a, a good piece. Um, I think it's in Yankee Magazine. So this guy in, in Boston, basically bought up all this, all these quota from all these other fishermen and had all these kind of, you know, illegal fish tracking schemes and was swapping in Pollock for Haddock and Haddock for Cod and just a big mess and sort of basically gamed the system. The major problem with cat shares is if you don't put in a provision that limits consolidation, you can end up with these big, huge players that come in and buy up all the quota. And then once you have um, too much power within a fishery, you start kind of dictating to managers what they can and can't do. And that, of course, throws off the whole balance of, of, of managing fisheries. I think there's a lot of discord in New England right now. A lot of people see it. You know, it's funny. There's all sorts of conspiracy. You know, fishermen are great on conspiracy theories, um, as you can imagine. Um, you know, one conspiracy theory is that the Pew Charitable Trust, which, you know, originally derived from Sun Oil, um, was that the Pew Charitable Trust were pushing cat shares because secretly they wanted to get the fishermen off the water so that they could sell the offshore oil rights or claim the offshore oil rights. I mean, kind of not exactly true, but, but there's still, you know, there's, there's a lot of paranoia about it. And because this guy, the Codfather, I'm blanking on his name, he eventually um, got arrested, went to jail. Um, the whole idea of catch shares in New England anyway has really been delegitimized. But what are we gonna do? You know, return to the race for fish? How are we gonna, is it possible to have a sustainable fishery based on catch shares? Thing is, it actually works in the Pacific, particularly in Alaska and other places, because there's still enough fish out there. So, you know, if you still have catch shares, I mean, if you still have abundant fisheries where you're paying a lot to have your share and some of that money is going into the management of fisheries and the oversight of fisheries, it's a kind of positive feedback loop. But if you institute them in already very depleted fisheries, it can kind of be a race to the bottom, which I think is kind of what happened in New England. But I, you know, I wasn't on the ground through that whole process, but I know there's a lot of, lot of bad blood right now, a lot of ill will, especially towards the nonprofits who tried to push it through. Hello, my name is Sonia. Hi. My question is going back to the picture you showed of the different organizations managing the water bodies across the world. Yeah. And I'm curious if you've seen any differences in how different parts of the world are managing the water bodies and if there's any consensus across the globe or how different is it regionally? It varies. Um, you know, there was a lot of attention focused on ICAT on the Atlantic. Um, commission for a long time, particularly because it had this sort of star figure in the form of the Atlantic bluefin tuna. So there's a lot of attention paid to it. Um, anecdotally, people seem to think that, that some of the management problems were, were corrected, particularly in the Mediterranean. And we did see a few good year classes of bluefin tuna as a result of better management. Nowadays, a lot of people, particularly like the, the NGO community, is paying a lot of attention, focusing a lot of attention on the Pacific Management Councils, because that's really where the bread and butter, you know, canning tunas are coming from. And, you know, it's hard to say, is it, you know, there are certain, there's a whole, there's kind of a split in the fisheries management community. There, you know, is one wing that's sort of championed by this guy named Ray Hilborn um, out in Washington State at the University of Washington, who kind of thinks it's all working and you know, believes the data is getting better and we're getting better and better. And then there's the sort of Daniel Pauly camp, and he's at the University of British Columbia, who feels that everything's underreported. And in fact, we're not taking 80 million metric tons of fish out of the sea, we're taking 120 million if you count all the illegal fishing. So 
it's a controversy. One thing that's been thrown out recently within the NGO community is that maybe we should start thinking about having no fishing in international waters. So just, you know, quick tutorial. Um, you know, countries control, because of the UN um, uh, tr uh, Commission on, uh, Treaty on the Law of the Sea, um, back in the past, I think, in the early 80s, there is a 200-mile um, exclusive economic zone around all continental areas, with some exceptions when there's overlap. Um, in between those, what are called those EEZs, those exclusive economic zones, is, is the high seas, owned by no one. And police really, in a way, are control, managed only by these regional fisheries management organizations. So there's some people out there who say, let's close the high seas to fishing altogether. Let's not even do it, because we can't manage it. I think it's a good question for a graduate student. <laughs> so if anyone wants a thesis for, you know, up for grabs, if you want to do it. Next question. Any other questions? Hi, I'm Mike Levine. I'm an organic farmer in the area. Um, I eat fish every day. I love fish. But I'm really uh, dismayed that uh, the Great Lakes fish, as well as inland lakes, are all fairly polluted. Uh, I've been told that all the inland lakes in Michigan have, the fish in them have uh, too much mercury. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned that you ate fish for a year, you had too much mercury, there was some mention of PCBs. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we hear about microplastics. Uh, so I, I tend to just eat like wild salmon, sardines, and anchovies. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. I'm not really confident eating anything else. And then when you look at like the Monterey, uh, list of you know which fish are safe and which ones aren't. Sometimes they say, well, this one's these ones are you know sustainable to eat these, but then they don't say whether they're toxic or not. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Maybe give me some ideas to uh, diversify my my seafood diet. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you're pretty much spot on with your wild salmon, sardines, and anchovies if you're trying to you know maximize your omega threes and minimize your toxic load. I find, found myself in a similar conundrum when I was going on the seafood diet for a year. And it is true that some grand unifying theory of what's sustainable to eat and what's healthy to eat has really not been pulled together. There were for a while, and I think it's still out there on the web, Environmental Defense Fund had a rating system for seafood on, from a pollutant's point of view. But they did not mesh it with their sustainability criteria. And I think even at Harvard, they were trying to do that. Um, problem becomes is that, you know, a fish might have, you know, there might be this notion of a species, but that species is spread out far and wide across the, you know, the, the swaths of the ocean. So who knows where they've been? Who knows what, you know, what they've eaten? This is one argument, weirdly enough, for aquaculture. You know, generally what fish, pollutants get into fish through what they eat. And I don't like to put this out there, but you know, an aquacultured fish, you kind of know what it ate, right? If you can control the feed supply, you kind of know what it's, what it's eating. Interestingly enough, when that whole PCB thing happened in the early 2000s for farmed salmon, we could exactly trace where it was coming from because when that, it was called the Heights Report, and they looked at all these salmon from all different parts of the world, and they found that the salmon coming from the Northern Hemisphere were markedly dirtier than the ones coming from the southern hemisphere. But it's basically because the northern hemisphere is more polluted than the southern hemisphere. But this circles back to, you know, this is like an existential question of the fish eater, right? And it goes back to that Yiddish proverb, don't shit where you eat. For two centuries, we've been shitting where we've been eating. And we've logged off these marine and aquatic food systems and surrendered them to pollution, which is a travesty and a crime. You know, like you think about like what Kodak did on the shores of Lake Ontario. You think about the amount of Agent Orange byproduct that was put into the New York Bite. You know, the New York Bite was the largest producer of oysters in the United States and then possibly in the world at one point. And then it became a waste disposal system. So for your own health, yeah, stick to the anchovies and the, and the sardines and the wild salmon. You know, look at a few different aquaculture producers and, you know, f try and investigate what their feed systems are like. Um, and all the while, you just have to, you know, as an organic farmer, you know, you have to fight for, you know, getting the dirt and the filth out of our food. And it's like, it's, it's, it's flying below the radar of most people, but it's really important. I think that Yiddish proverb can kind of sum up our whole semester, <laughs> too. Um, thank you for taking us off the land and into the ocean for thank our you. last class. And thank you all again for being a part of this great semester. My pleasure. Thank you.